Hey gang, this one's for all those guys who keep asking me to do more electric guitar videos. And uh, to be honest, I think my average electric guitar repair is not nearly as interesting from a narrative standpoint, well, at least to me, as some of the um, acoustic work I do. But regardless, people want to see it, so I will tr endeavor to give you what you want to see. What we have here is a Tokai uh, ES335 clone. Um, I'm assuming it's from probably 2005-2008 era. Uh, there's no serial number or label inside, but that's what I'm assuming. And it's owned by a local musician who's got an album release party coming up next week, and he would like to play this guitar there, and he wants it playing its best. He's noticed a few little issues regarding tuning that he'd like to have addressed. So I think this video is basically going to be me sort of describing my assessment techniques. When someone gives me a guitar and I want, it, I want to find out what's going on with it, we'll, I'll take you through the process and the basic setup, and... We'll get this back out to him as quick as we can. Now the player is actually pretty happy with the way the guitar is playing overall, except for one thing. He notices that uh, when he's chording in first position, specifically the D chord, the guitar can be perfectly in tune. When he grabs that D, it sounds out of tune for him, which is very annoying. First thing I did when I took the guitar from him is I uh, checked to see the nut slot heights in the first position here. So I'm fretting the third fret and pushing down to see how much space is between the bottom of the string and the top of the fret. And there's a little more than there needs to be here. This is often the case in a factory setup. You know, they want to make sure that when this thing hits the showroom floor, there's absolutely no chance that it's going to buzz. So they, they leave things just a little bit tall. This has never been addressed. Uh, the other thing is, this guitar has obviously jumbo frets, and they're quite tall. And um, you can actually, depending on how hard you press, bend a, a string sharp a little bit. So playing technique comes into uh, effect as well. The other thing I'm noticing is that there's a bit of fret munch here, it's mostly on the B string, and yeah, here on that D, we're getting a little bit wide here. Now on these jumbo frets that are about 100 and I think they're about 110 thousandths wide, if we wear that top down a bit, you can change the intonation point and move it back towards the nut by, in this case, probably a sixty-fourth of an inch, and that, that can be enough, depending on how sensitive you are uh, to cause things to change a bit. So maybe we'll do a little bit of recrowning on there for him as well. Okay, so the very first thing we do before we touch anything is to make sure it makes sound. Controls are nice and quiet. They all seem to do what they're supposed to do, so we can move on. Okay, I'm going to do an action measurement here. I always do that at the 12th fret, regardless of the instrument I'm working on. Uh, I know some people suggest electrics should be measured at the 17th, but because I work on so many different things, it's just helpful to have like a consistent bass line. So whether it's a bazooki, a mandolin, or an electric guitar, it's a 12th fret. And I use a metal machinist rule for this, graduated an old-fashioned imperial 64ths of an inch, which will infuriate certain viewers. I don't care. I like 64ths because uh, they're easily manageable, and I can feel the difference in height between one 64th of an inch and another when it comes to action adjustment. And I can also see them on the, the ruler. Anything smaller than that, it gets hard to view. So I know there are other people who use feeler gauges to do this, or fancy little dial indicator jobs. Uh, there are other people who don't measure at all. They just, you know, they know what they like and they can sort of do it by feel. Uh, to my mind, because, you know, I work on so many guitars and sometimes they come back after a while, I want to check and see whether any, anything has changed. It's just nice to know what it was, so I measure. And um, despite being in 64ths of an inch, sometimes I'll say something weird, like this happens to be four and a half 64ths on the bass side, which is pretty nice. On the treble, ooh, we're pretty high actually. We are more than six sixty-fourths, six and a half sixty-fourths on the treble side, which is pretty high. Uh, way higher than it needs to be. Um, that could also be causing some of the tuning issues. So we should probably bring those both in line and uh, make them more consistent. Okay, so up next I'm going to check the neck relief. Now. In most strings instruments, under string tension, there will be some up bow to the neck as the strings try to pull the neck towards the body. And a little bit of neck relief, or this slight bow, is uh, beneficial. Because the string, as it's vibrating, creates a kind of elongated elliptical, sort of an American football shape. 
And to have the frets mimic that shape, that means we can get the action a little bit lower without it buzzing. So to measure that, the way I do it is I put a capo on the first fret, and I will hold down the strings at around the body joint. I use feeler gauges to check the distance, the clearance between the bottom of the string and the top of the fret, and I usually do this at the sixth fret. And this actually has quite low relief. So when I'm setting up a new guitar, I usually shoot for about 10 to 12 thousandths. That was about 8 thousandths. So this guitar, yeah, it's around 7 thousandths of an inch relief at the sixth fret. It's low, there's no buzzing right now, and it's not too much of an issue. There are people who like to set up necks perfectly straight. Uh, that's fine if you've got a really good setup. Uh, if the frets are in great shape, you can do that. Uh, most people, I mean, a good average is maybe 10 to 12 thousandths. The first thing we're going to do before I try anything with the action is to bring these nut slots down so that they're at the correct height above the frets. And on these high strings, that's somewhere around 15 thousandths of an inch, but it's usually easier just to do them by feel. That's better. So it helps to pay attention to the style of music the customer plays. In this case, uh, I'm going to be lowering the action on the treble side. He was quite happy with the action on the bass side of four and a half sixty fourths. I'm going to take the treble down to about four, uh, which is, I consider that kind of a good medium average rock and roll setup. It's not going to satisfy your your shredder who wants it, you know, way down there at like two and a half sixty fourths or three. Uh, and there are some masochists out there who will actually play their guitar with the strings higher than this up at like five or six sixty fourths. Um, but I think, you know, four and a half to four, good, even middle of the road setup. When I'm lowering the action on a tunematic style bridge like this, if I'm uh, turning the screw so that the bridge is lowering, I don't feel it necessary to uh, take the string tension off. If, however, I'm going to be raising the action up, you do definitely want to either lower the string tension or use something called a bridge jack, which is basically a little padded uh, pry bar which will hold the bridge up while you do this adjustment. Otherwise, you're in danger of stripping the threads on the adjustment screw, or um, you can cause you know weird tension issues with the bridge itself. It'll lock up in one position and not really want to move, and then Anyway, just be aware that you want to be gentle with these metal parts, even though they're metal. You don't want to be cranking on them too hard. So lowering it's okay to keep the strings at tension, raising it, lower the string tension, or find some other way of propping up the bridge. Okay, so we're at 4 64ths on that high E string now, and it plays cleanly and great all the way across the board, up until the very top fret. The last one is a little bit high and it's choking out the notes below it. So I'm going to have to address that. This is sort of murky territory. Does this fall under the banner of a typical setup, like what you would normally do? No, but you really can't leave it like this. If you want it to play well, you have to do this. So I'm going to, as I said, address the, uh, the frets at the bottom end of the board. I'll also do this one, just so it's clean for him all the way along. While I'm here, I'll measure the pickup height. I do that by fretting the last fret and checking the distance between the bottom of the string and the pole piece or the screw. And on the neck pickup for a humbucker, usually around an eighth of an inch or three thirty seconds of an inch is uh, pretty standard. That's about right. On the bridge pickup, however, I can tell right away that this is quite low. And yeah, it's almost three sixteenths of an inch below the strings. Sometimes um, people will lower the pickup to sort of balance the output of two very disparate outputs, uh, but more often than not it's just it's not been set up correctly. So I think what we'll do is after we've done the fret work and restrung it, we will bring the strings up, listen to it a bit, and then uh, adjust it so that it's right. Uh, normally I would expect to see about a sixteenth of an inch below the, uh, the string for my bridge pickup.
just getting that last fret. The you know, other guys who suggest I should put this on a plec machine for just this one little bum note at the very top end of the fretboard. Before I take the strings off, let's have a look at this. I find this really kind of novel. This player, when he strings, the string exits the hole, he bends it around over itself and crimps really tightly, so you've got this little rounded thing that you can't possibly hurt yourself with. That's kind of nice. Uh, as for the number of wraps around the post, etc., there are all kinds of debate about that, and I'll let you figure out which way you like to do it yourself. Personally, I'm one wrap over, one wrap under, and I get, you know, reasonably good tuning and, and no slippage, so... Figure out the way that works for you and just stick with it and tell everyone that yours is the right way. Okay, so these frets here in lower positions, as I mentioned, had quite a lot of dents going on there from string wear. And what I'm doing here isn't really a fret dress where I'm leveling them all to the same height. This is sort of like a partial recrowning exercise. And where these larger dents are, uh, and they've moved out towards the sides of the frets, what this is going to do is sort of re-establish the crown a bit and move those flat spots in towards the center and re-establish the intonation point as the center of the fret. So what I'm using here is a three-corner file which has a safe edge on the bottom which I've ground down. And it's what I like for this job. It's just it's quick and easy and I can see what I'm doing. So after the major dents are gone, we'll get some wet dry sandpaper and micro mesh and polish them up so that they're good and shiny. And do some cleanup with some naphtha, otherwise known as lighter fluid. I happen to use the Ronsonol brand, mostly because that's the one that Jimmy used at Monterey when he was burning his guitar, so I figure it's traditional. Um, you could buy like painters and varnish makers naphtha in like a paint store and pay a whole lot more money. This thing has that nice dispensing cap too. Yes, it's a petroleum distillate. Yes, it could harm you if you ingested a whole lot of it. Uh, obviously, you know, use it at your own risk. Lots of ventilation, the whole thing. It does a good job, gets rid of most of the grunge. This board isn't that bad, actually. It's pretty clean. Yeah, not bad at all. Now I'm just going to use a little lemon oil. You could use linseed oil. Uh, linseed oil or other polymerizing oils like tongue oil, polymerized tongue oil. If you use them too heavily and too often, you'll end up with a sticky buildup because um, it'll actually form a film. When I build a guitar, I use a couple of coats of polymerized tongue oil as a base coat. But this is just sort of something you use every, like, you know, once or twice a year. It's not nourishing the wood, it's just slows down moisture absor absorption and release, that's all. To clean the body, which is kind of dusty and gross, I'm going to use just one of the proprietary Guitar Maker's uh, cleaner polishes. You gotta be careful because some of the more aggressive cleaners have abrasive particles in them, which can scuff a finish. So this stuff, this stuff's working pretty good. So that's what I like. Just to get rid of some of the, the nastiest stuff. I don't, you know, go too in depth when it comes to cleaning. I figure if someone wants a clean guitar, they can clean it themselves. It's not what I'm really here for. I'll get rid of the, the really major stuff. Unless you're going to pay me to clean it, I'm not going to do it. Okay, stringing a Bigsby. How do players do this? If and, you know, I look inside their cases, there's never a little wedge there. This is just a piece of soft wood. It's a wedge. It's got some cork on the bottom. And I use it after I get the string around the pin. And this just wedges in under there, either from the back or the front. Depends on the style of the Bigsby. And it just keeps things in place while I do the rest of the whole procedure, you know, getting the string underneath the, the arm and over the bridge and into the tuning post. And it's not going to fall off. Like, without this, it, you know, every time you do this, it falls off at least once. So, there's your tip for the day. Just doing some intonation work. This player plays a half step down, so the guitar is tuned to E flat. And we're just checking to see to make sure the saddles are in the right location. What I'm doing here is um, playing an open string, making sure it's in tune, checking it with the 12th fret, so I'm playing the octave up. And I want those two notes to be the same. Sometimes I'll use the harmonic. Not bad. 
the fretted note is just slightly sharp. So I know that if the fretted note is sharp, the saddle's got to move away from the headstock. I'm going to have to um, adjust the bridge, move things back just a little bit. In this case, one turn of the screw should probably do it, because we were awful close. Okay, so the Tokai is back to being Tokai, and the D chord sounds pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. 